Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala issues this instruction to his beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and tells him and proclaim to mankind the Hajj. They shall come to you on foot and on every lean riding beast, arriving from every deep valley, to witness that which brings them benefit and to remember Allah over that which he has bestowed upon them of the animals that they are to eat. So let them eat therefrom, and let them feed therefrom the weak and the destitute. Then let them end their unkemptness, and let them fulfill their vows, and let them make their tawaf around the ancient house. This is an announcement that the Holy Prophet is being invited to make to his people. And they had the Hajj before, and they distorted it from the pure Hajj, the pure ritual of their father Ibrahim, السلام, the forgotten forefather whose ways they had mutilated until they became not the ways of the one, but the many. Not the ways of the one God, but the ways of many gods. Not the ways of one humanity and one Ummah, but the ways of many tribes for years and hundreds of years, even thousands of years, fighting one against the other. They had been invited to the one and they had chosen the many. And the Holy Prophet وسلم, is being invited to invite them back to that which is the true fitrah, the way of Ibrahim السلام, the easy way, al hanifiyyati samha, that which is pure, primordial, Abrahamic, monotheistic and easy and tolerant, inclusive and noble. This is the proclamation that he makes. And in this proclamation there is so much. And in the Hajj there are so many mysteries. We know that it is, in a sense, the culmination of our Islam. The crown, or the jewel in the crown of our Islam. So we call it Ibadatul Umr. Or we call it Tamamul Islam. Or Kamalul Deen. It has so many titles that indicate that it is the perfection of the religion. But when we are there, we see mystery upon mystery upon mystery. Usually when people reach Mecca, they have not done their Hajj before, or perhaps an Umrah before, and they are confronted with so much that seems unfamiliar. The Tawaf. There's nothing else like that in Islam. The Sa'i. The standing on Arafat. The stoning of the devils. All of these things are new, and yet people fold into those rituals with such ease. Why? Because it is the Sunnah of their forefather Abraham, and because it corresponds to their Fitrah. And because they know that this is the high point of their lives as Muslims. They know that this is a culmination. They know that they have to pay attention and get it right. Or they have to return next year if they have the resources. So there is this focus. There is this attentiveness. There is this devotion, this determination to follow truly and purely in the footsteps of their forefather Abraham. In this wonderful culmination. So we look at these mysteries and we say, what does it mean to do tawaf? Why does it have to be seven times Sa'i between Safa and Marwa? And is it just a reenactment of what the ancient uh, great ones, the patriarchs, and in the case of the Sa'i, the matriarchs did before us? Is there some reason for all of this? Of course, there is nothing in this world, and there is certainly nothing in Allah's religion that is abath or meaningless. But sometimes the meanings are too deep for our weak minds to understand. Why do we pray five times a day? Not six times a day, not four times a day. There is a reason a deep divine reason that is to do with the need of our souls for a kind of nourishment. But what do we know of the real nature of our souls? What do we know of the spirit? Of knowledge you've been given only a little. But the Hajj does have this effect. And it does have this sobering effect. And it does change people and those who have done it. And what others who are doing it can see as one of the most extraordinary vindications of the process of Hajj. How people on the bus going to Mecca, maybe fighting who's going to sit where, and why is this not comfortable, and why is the air conditioning not working, and why haven't I got a bottle of water, and this is what they're talking about on their way. And I've done Hajj several times, this is the conversation. On the way back again, four days later, five days later, whenever it might be, just listen to that conversation and see how they share out the water, and see how they don't even notice the air conditioning, and see how they stop by the side of the road in case there's somebody sitting there on a suitcase who hasn't got a ride. See the difference that it's made. See the difference that it's made. How does it make this difference? How does it reach into our souls and turn our hearts about? 
This is a divine mystery. It's like a medicine. You don't know how it works. The doctor has some idea of how it works, but it works, and that's what matters. When I was living in Saudi Arabia, I knew this lawyer. He was from a Western country and had converted to Islam in order to marry this Muslim girl, never thought of practicing anything and was quite frank about this. His house full of dogs and pictures and not really into the religion. But on his iqama, his, uh, his residency permit, it said Muslim. So one year, when Dhul Hijjah rolled around, he said, well, I've heard of this Hajj. He said, the Hajj sounds really interesting. I'll go and see what it's like. I can go. I've got this bitaka. So off he went. And when he came back, he was a different person. He was praying. He had a tasbih, he had a kind of faraway look in his eyes. His wife, who was quite secular, was not entirely happy with this transformation. But this is the power. How does it work? Why does it work? This is part of Allah's knowledge of our souls and what they require, of which we have so little knowledge. But we need that. We need that transformation. And we need that purification, because our days are full of impurity. And they build up in the heart, as Imam Ali says, like dark spots each time we do something bad, or look at something we shouldn't look at, or think something. The dark spots accumulate until the heart becomes, as he says, Karlam Allah wajhu, all black. We need something that's going to wash that away. We know that we need something that can wash that away. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us these outward forms whereby he brings about this purification. Man hajja, this is a hadith sahih in Bukhari and Muslim, Abu Huraira narrates it. قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ مَنْ حَجَّ وَلَمْ يَرْفُثْ وَلَمْ يَفْسُقْ خَرَجَ مِنْ ذُنُوبِهِ كَيَوْمِ وَلَدَتُ أُمُّ Whoever does the hajj and does not say something inappropriate or obscene and does not break any of the regulations, he departs from his sins as the day his mother bore, bore him, gave birth to him. That's something that we need. To press the reset button, all of that stuff that we know we've done and the stuff that we don't remember that we've certainly done that's, pu that's made us impure, that's made us complicated, hypocritical, hiding our vices, uncomfortable with ourselves, we can press that reset button, marked Hajj, and we can start again. This is through Allah's generosity. And no secular psychology can access that reset button. They just say, take some Valium, do cognitive therapy, whatever, but we have that, alhamdulillah. But there are rules, because it has to be a real hajj. Not just going through the motions. You could train a robot, probably, or train a monkey, who knows, to do all of those things. That's not what the hajj really is about in terms of the internalizing of the message. And about bringing about this extraordinary cleansing that we all yearn for. We need al-hajj al-mabrur. Al-hajj al-mabrur. Which means the hajj that does fulfill the obligations. So if you've just done the tawaf six times, you didn't count, that's not a hajj. Come back next year, you can't do anything about that. Some of the things you can make a fidu or sa fidu sacrifice for out of Allah's mercy, but there are certain things that you really have to do that are arkan. Uh, those are indispensable, but also the inward state. How are you? How are you dealing with other people? Are you noticing other people? Are you putting your phone down for a moment and actually noticing, because it's about difficult engagements with other people, and it is hard. The Hajj is supposed to be about hardship. It is a tough ordeal. It's not comfortable. Even though nowadays the tour guides seem to think that it should be some kind of, you know, like going to Dubai or something, five-star hotels and buffet. That's not the message of the Hajj at all. Uh, because in this, the, the, the famous uh, Hadith Qudsi, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is boasting to his angels of the Hajjis. And he says, Unzuru ila ibadi, atuni shu'than ghubran dahin. Look at my slaves, he says, on the day of Arafah. They've come to me with messy hair, dusty on their clothes, really suffering from the heat. I call you to witness that I have forgiven them because of this. And the ayah we began with says, Let them, when the day of Eid comes, put aside all of the sweaty and the whatever it is, garments, the curry spent on it, spelt on it, whatever it is, the discomfort. Let them put that aside. The Hajj is supposed to be uncomfortable. And it's through that discomfort that we forget dunya. And another hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, the Holy Prophet says uh, uh, that the mabrur Hajj khayrun min dunya wa ma fiha is better than the dunya and everything in it. And the Hajjis see that. The focus is on Allah's house. It's not out to what's outside, the Bab Abdul Aziz, to the 
KFC and the Starbucks is no, it's towards Allah's house. Despite all the distractions and the flashing lights and the giant clock, it's towards Allah's house. It's around Allah's house that they're going, even though there's no money in that for anybody. It's Allah's gift to the world. He doesn't charge for his religion. Everything else is part of the economy. That is not, this is his gift. But the Hajj also bears reflection. If we read the, what the ulama have said about the Hajj, we can benefit more. Because the danger is we go there and it's so spectacular, the most amazing thing in the world that we're kind of looking at this and looking at that and that's not good either. You should be looking down and at the Kaaba and focusing on the Ahkam and focusing on correct adab with others and this wonderful moment of Muslim solidarity and unity and breathing that holy air and thinking about the great ones who have lived there and remembering or trying to remember what it's about. Two things that we know it's about. There is, as it were, at the centre of the Hajj, there is the Kaaba and the stone, and at the outer edge of the Hajj there is Arafat, which is the furthest we go. And this, the ulama say, is about the beginning and the end of time. Real time, not time, not dunya time, which is what we experience with the clocks ticking and linear time and laws of relativity. No, real time, the unimaginable dahar, which is part of Allah's creation. We go to Arafat. And Arafat is uh, what we would nowadays call a preview or perhaps a prequel of the last day of the Yawm al-Qiyamah and there we are wearing a simple garment as it's possible to get nothing on our heads the sun is pretty extreme everybody else is there and it is a prequel of the last day which is the certain outcome of all of us nobody here knows what anybody else here is likely to be doing tomorrow but we all know what we'll be doing on the Yawm al-Qiyamah the last day Standing, the wuquf, that's what it's about. And the du'a there is about gratitude. Here I have an anticipation of that last day, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving me the ability still to pray, and I can go back and put some things right. That's his generosity. That's part of the gift of the hajj. So it's about the end of time, and about the sa'id al-qiyamah, the terrible flat plain uh, of the sahira. Uh, the wakeful plain where the divine is present and nobody can escape. There's no rocks to crawl under to hide our bad, ha- bad habits. The day when all our secrets are made plain to everybody, that terrifying day. Allah is giving us the best preview we'll ever have in this dunya on the Yawm Arafat. So that's the essence of Hajj, Al Hajj Arafat. And let us make sure that we make use of that every moment of it. You go to Arafah nowadays and the tents are air-conditioned and you can see people watching television in their tents and it's, that's a missed opportunity, brothers. You're not here for that. Switch off just for a few hours and remember the terrible day. You can only benefit from that. You can only benefit from that. So at the end of time, we have the Hajj pointing towards that, but the Hajj also points us back towards the beginning of time in an even more strange way. The Hajj is pointing towards the future beyond the end of this time when the clock stopped ticking and things are really different. Also pointing back. And it's pointing back through the mystery of the Kaaba, which is there to be mysterious. This, the black, impenetrable, geometrical symbol of the unknowability and the eternity of God. The Tenzi. Laysa kamithli hi shay. What do we know of the divine? Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, laysa kamithlihi shay. But we go around it as we make our ibadah. And the going around with our hearts towards it has an effect of reconfiguration. And the center of it is not the black stone, but is properly speaking the space in the Kaaba. But the black stone indicates where we begin the tawaf and where we end it. The black stone, another of the mysteries of the Hajj. Non Muslims like to ask about it, they tend to assume that the Hajj is all. Uh, but it has a significance. Fihi ayatun bayinat. Allah says, of the sanctuary of the Haram, it contains clear signs. Maqamu Ibrahim. We can work out what that means, and we pray that. And the other things, the Yemeni corner, you can see. But the black stone is one of the mysteries. We know from the hadith in Tirmidhi, Al Hajar al Aswad, Yaqutun min Yawaqit al Jannah. It is a ruby of paradise. A ruby of paradise. Does that take us much forward? It tells us that it's not really from this world, whatever its chemical composition might be is not the point. 
any more than I am significantly defined by the physical origin of the atoms that make up the clay of which I'm made. That's not really what it is. Scientists can look at that. But the black stone of Hajar al-Aswad, with its mystery, the beginning of the tawaf, the beginning of the hajj, uh, the, the culmination, and in some methods the cut-off point of the talbiyah, what is that? Well, here too there is a big sign that the ulama have spoken about. We know that we begin by kissing the black stone. Well, uh, that's uh, an ideal. Of course, if you have three million people on the Hajj, it's not logistically going to be possible. And generally, the ulama say it, it can be dangerous. Even at an ordinary time during Umrah, you have to kind of elbow your way in to get near the black stone. And there's dozens of big Afghans doing the same thing. And it's, there's a policeman thwacking people on the head. And quite right, too. It's, it's difficult. It's an intense Jalali place. But people want to follow the sunnah. Uh, but there's ithan given to some people to do that. I remember on my first hajj, I was with this American convert. He was about a teenager. Very thin, kind of delicate, artistic type. And at the beginning he said, I really have to kiss the black stone. I said, whoa. <laughs> it takes about two hours to get from the outside of the mataf into the Kaaba, spiralling in with all of the jostling. You don't have to do that, you just make the istilam, that's also sunnah, that's perfectly acceptable. Eight hours later, after the seven tawafs, he came back and said, it was really easy. I kissed the black stone, it was great. I realised that's just because of the purity of his new Muslim soul, Allah had opened a road for him and he'd been able to do that. I've never been able to do that, except once uh, during Umrah, so alhamdulillah. But what is the point of that? Well, there's an interesting indication in one of the most important Qur'anic verses that speaks of where we are truly from. And this is where religion becomes the opposite of the secular atheistic world. For them, we live and die, وَمَا يُهْلِكُنَا إِلَى الدَّهَرِ Only time brings us to an end, and it's the mind that generates consciousness. We're nothing more than that. Meet computers. But for us, not only do we go on forever, beyond the Sa'id al-Qiyamah to Allah's unimaginable consequences for how we chose to orient ourselves in this life, eternity. But we also have a prehistory, which is even harder to grasp. It's like trying to remember what it was like to be in the womb. We can't do that. Similarly, those who are in the womb, what can they imagine of the life of this world? Nothing very accurate. So when we think about what's beyond the curtain of death and the akhirah, we can kind of conjure with a few pictures and words, and revelation is there to give us the most accurate possible words, but still it will be something else. Al-yawma kashafna anka ghita'aka fabasaruka al-yawma hadid. Allah will say to us today, we've taken the veil from your eyes, and this day your eyes are sharp. Now you can really see. Now it's just what's outside the womb. We've heard certain things. Amanna wa saddaqna. But it's before that, before even the conception in the womb, there is this amazing verse where إِذْ أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَنِي آدَمَ مِنْ زُهُورِهِمْ ذُرِّيَتَهُمْ فَأَشْهَدَهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ قَالُوا بَلَا شَهِدْنَا ذَلِكَ أَنْ تَقُولُوا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ إِنَّا كُنَّا عَنْ هَذَا غَافِلِينَ It's in the Qur'an and it's so mysterious. What is it referring to? What it seems to be saying is this. Translation never gives you half of 1% of the majesty of the meanings of Allah's book, but as an interpretation. But when Allah took the covenant from Bani Adam, from their seeds, in other words, the ulama say all of the descendants of Adam implicitly were present at that day, and he bore, caused them to bear witness against themselves. For and And he said, Alastu bi rabbikum. Am I not your Lord? And we all said, Bala shahidna, yes, we bear witness. In that state, as sinless, primordial, pre-born individuals with the divine presence asking us a question, how could we say anything else? And there's no possibility of any kufr there. Even Iblis's disobedience has not yet happened. Bala shahidna, yes, we bear witness. And then he says, that was, lest you say on the last day, we didn't know about this. We already know. The basis of human fitra, of our nature, is to believe, to know. Our heart is always beating Allah, 
Allah. We are designed to see Allah's unity in the multiplicity of the physical world. He's given us so many signs and disbelief is a monstrous abuse of our humanity, a mental illness. The only unforgivable aberration in the human species, whatever else we do. If we don't have Iman then we've really messed up. Really messed up. Like the fetus that doesn't open its eyes when it goes into something even worse than that. So we have that primordial moment and the Hajj with its big deployment of these huge meta-historical themes, the end of time and even before the beginning of time, that mysterious verse. And the ulama are very careful about interpreting this verse, but we know that we were all there together saying, Bala shahidna, yes we bear witness, shahada is natural to us, uh, that this has something to do with the Hajj. Very famous narrations in all of the history books of, of, of Mecca. وَكَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ يُقَبِّلُهُ كَثِيرًا The Holy Prophet used to kiss the stone frequently. فَقَبَّلَهُ Omar, And later Omar did. ثُمَّ قَالْ إِنِّي أَعْلَمُ أَنَّكَ حَجَرٌ لَا تَنْفَعُ وَلَا تَضُرُ وَلَوْلَا أَنِّي رَأَيْتُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ يُقَبِّلُكَ مَا قَبَّلْتُكَ he said, talking to the stone, I know you're just a stone, you can't help me, you can't harm me, and but for the fact that I saw the Holy Prophet وسلم, kissing you, I wouldn't kiss you. And then he wept until he started sobbing. And he turns around, and there is Ali. And you see the, 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 the pairing of the two personalities, Imam Omar with his greatness of pulling together the Arabians, of opening the futur to the horizons with his stick, his severity, his love for, for Allah's deen and for his sharia. Is he obeying out of obedience to the Holy Prophet and is weeping. And then he sees another of the great uh, rainbow of spiritual types of the Sahaba, Imam Ali who is the gate of knowledge and is, is, has a certain inner awareness of some of these ahkam. We don't say one is better than the other except in the sharia we tend to assume that amruhum fil fadli kal khilafa. This is what our aqidah says, ahl sunnah wal jama'ah. The first is best, but there's so many different ways for human beings to be best that it's in practice complex. In any case, he turns around and Ali is there. You can imagine what an amazing place the haram was like then when you saw these great ones Every day you went to the Haram and there you would see the Sahaba. Subhanallah. And Imam Ali says, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, bal yadur wa yanfa. He says, O oh, Amir al Mu'mineen, it does help and it does harm. Qal kayf? He said, How? Qal, Lama akhad Allahu mithaqa ala dhurriya, katabahu alayhim kitaban, thumma alqamahu hadha al hajar. He said, when Allah took the covenant from the descendants of Adam, this is the day of Alas to Rabbikum, he wrote it, wrote it, and quote marks. Who knows what that could mean? And then he fed it to this stone. And so the stone testifies to the belief of the mu'min and to the kufr of, uh, and the, the rejection, the treasonable outlook of the kafir. That's another deep thought. And it's a kind of thought that works with the heart and not the mind. Uh, what's the relationship of a concept of an ancient covenant to uh, a block of stone? The mind can't go there. But we know when we begin the momentous, obligatory uh, obedience of the tawaf, that the signal for that is something momentous that's to do with this thing that's before the beginning of time, and is the meaning of the talbiyah, and is the meaning of the shahada itself. When we are there, disorienting ourselves, reorienting ourselves, by going round and around until we've forgotten which way is all that stuff of dunya just outside the doors, and that's part of the wisdom of the tawaf, just to make us not think about the directions of dunya, but to focus only on al-wahid, al-qahar, and the representation of his, his, his power, his majesty, his eternity, his unknowability, his throne, that we have in that the reminder of the day of alas to bi rabbikum, that's there in, in the Holy Qur'an. And this is another of the things that the ulama have, have found in their meditations on the depth of the Hajj and the beauty of the Hajj, but there's so many other things. And of course, it's the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he's not made this religion to be a preserve for intellectuals. The simplest Muslim can get these things out 
of the Hajj just as well as some fancy academic philosopher, maybe even better, because Allah loves the pure-hearted and simplicity is usually best. Simplicity rather complexity is usually best. But when we think about these things, we see the majesty of the Hajj and we grow in love for Allah's house. We grow in love for the city. We grow in love for the other people who are there. And we remember, and this will be our final point, the importance of unity. It seems the whole Ummah is there. People from countries you haven't even heard of. People who look... It must have been extraordinary in the Middle Ages when people only saw people who looked like Arabs or Africans or Chinese to see that. The only place in the world where you could do that. Uh, this unity of the Ummah is important. Just as everybody is united at the end of time, just as everybody was united at or before the beginning of time, the Hajj also reminds us of the importance of unity. And that's really an important lesson for us, not just in preparing for death, the Akhirah, but for our current reality in the Ummah, because we're disunited. We tend to inflate, out of all proportion, things that are intrinsically little. We're all there saying the same talbiyah, around the same Kaaba. Nobody's doing it six times, nobody's doing it eight times. Alhamdulillah, Allah has more or less unified the ibadahs of this ummah. And you have to watch very carefully to see if somebody is from a different madhab or if they're Shia, or apart from certain tiny groups on the fringes. This is one of his blessings. And Allah loves to see this unity. And the Hajj is a representation of that unity. And where we lose that unity and we start fussing about other people uh, over things that intrinsically a thousand times less important than the La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah, and the Labaik, which is what we're there for, then the Ummah starts to crack and split, which is what we're seeing in so many Muslim countries now. Uh, take a look on the internet for the writings of Oded Yunoni, who's a right-wing Israeli uh, think tank commentator. He says, the only way Israel is going to survive in the long term is if we can get the Arabs to fight amongst themselves. And the only way we can really do that, if we get the Sunnis and the Shia and different kinds of people in each of those groups to fight amongst themselves. Well, Israelis are now sitting back and watching the show. We're doing their work for them. This is Shia, this is Sunni, this is Bid'ah, all of that stuff. There are legitimate questions in Aqidah and in Sharia. But I recently did an interview with the BBC. They're doing... Uh, in a week's time, a broadcast on Radio 4 about the Sunni Shi'i thing. And this non-Muslim producer said, I thought this was going to be an enormous difference. They're f killing each other in Pakistan, in so many places. I thought it would be like the East and the West. But in fact, when I look at it, the differences are so small compared to, say, the differences between the Methodists and the Greek Orthodox, which is like two completely different worlds. To me, it looks pretty small. Why are they fighting? Well, perhaps there's wisdom in that. There's certainly wisdom in looking for ways of unity, for looking at that which we have in common before we look at things that might divide us. Because when we allow ourselves to be divided, the enemies of Islam just sit back by the pool and watch us uh, tearing each other to pieces on the TV. They don't need to